Dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 19th Science Café. Thank you for joining us. Science Café is jointly organized by the Czech Centre Brussels and the representation of South Marine region to the EU with support of the Embassy of the Czech Republic to the Kingdom of Belgium. Due to the pandemic, we broadcast today from the South Moravian region. My name is Pavlina Pansová Šimková and I am your host. Science Café is an open forum where members of the public can meet distinguished scientists and discuss topical issues. It is not a formal lecture or panel debate, but an opportunity to, uh, for everyone to ask questions, to challenge the speaker and to express their opinion about the topic. Please bear in mind, there is no stupid question. Now it's my pleasure and honor to welcome Mikuláš Beck from the, Faculty of, uh, from the Faculty of Arts, Masaryk University in Brno. Mikuláš Beck has dedicated his scientific career to musicology and sociology of music. His research has mainly focused on sociology and cultural history of music in the 19th and 20th century. He was director of Masaryk University in Brno from 2011 to 2019. He has been a member of the Czech Senate since October 2018. Mikuláš Beck is also chairperson of the Committee of the EU Affairs within the Czech Senate and a member of the Standing Senate Commission on Compatriots Living Abroad. Now, about the topic and what we are going to discuss today. Musicology is a relatively young scientific field, sometimes noted as established in 1880, and the definition, which I like the most, is by Dan Elphick, that is thinking about music in a critical way. With you and Mr. Reck, we will focus mainly on music preferences and performances, and those who need to be uh, those which need to be considered in a broader context of societal values and principles, and how the social significance of perception of different kinds of music is now very relevant in the ever-changing world. Thank you, Mr. Beck, for joining us. And just for the audience, we want to make sure that we address all the queries and questions related to today's topic, so you can ask questions on all the platforms where we broadcast. I would like to start with a very broad and very open question. What is the position and role of the music in today's society? Hello, good afternoon from my Prague office. Well, it's not a simple question for a start, but I, I will try my best. <laughs> well, I, I think the, the main difference looking to the past is the fact that music, classical music, has lost its status as a sort of art religion. Kunstreligion is the German expression for that. Uh, about 1800, music used to be really seen as a sort of, of religious activity, as a manifestation of the absolute. And today music, even the classical music is mainly entertainment. It's, it's a change which has influenced heavily uh, the music business, uh, music life, concert agencies, uh, orchestras and opera houses, but it's a fact we have to cope with. Well, now I would turn the question around. You authored the article, A Social Critique of Czech Musicality, a typology of a, of a listener to music. So when the perception changed, how the listeners also changed? What, well, what is I, the difference? I have conducted a few surveys on music preferences and musical taste of the Czech audience, and I have done some secondary analysis of older surveys available from this country, and the results basically confirm results from other surveys in Western countries like US or, or Germany, the most important change is from a sort of cultural snob, from so-called univore listener to 
a sort of omnivore listener who is, you know, polyamorous. It's a person which likes many genres of music uh, together or simultaneously he has liking for classical music, ethno, folklore, jazz, uh, alternative rock music and such genres. Uh, it's a big change. We can identify such trends in many countries over the last two or three decades. And this change is connected with that lost status of, of art religion for, for classical music. And this change has resulted in a very difficult position for music institutions, which have to struggle for the listener with many other uh, entertainments or venues. Uh, the new listeners to music usually attend not only concert, but they have some liking for theater and arts. So these persons are really difficult to bind to one institution. But it's, a, it, it's an interesting change because these people are in a way more, I would say, you know, like Renaissance people in the broad interests. Well, when they have a broad interest, um, have you conducted also study how long it actually takes to the listener to decide whether they like the music or whether they like the motif? Well, that's a thing I haven't, you know, researched on much, but, well, in a way, it, it, it's a very fast process, you know, identification of, of genres of music goes in a way in which just the sound, the, the, a few seconds of music already suffice for the listener to recognize the pattern and to decide about, well, the general positive or negative attitude. Many researchers have conducted research with a sort of, you know, samples of music played to the audience. And it's quite interesting that people have a good knowledge of various music genres. It's, it's different to other sorts of art because in literature or theater, you don't have such broad spectrum of styles or genres which would be stabilized by the music industry or, or cultural industry. In, in the case of music, people are able to identify the genre after just, you know, two seconds of, of, of music being played. Uh, well, when you spoke about the massive number of the genres and uh, different uh, songs, sometimes I, maybe it's not exactly correct, to get a feeling that every time when there is a new recording, it's also presented as a new new brand. So what do you think, which, what, what causes such a massive room for various boxing of the ma ma of the genres in, in again last years or decades it's an interesting question well i think that the main reason is the fragmentation of today's societies we have enough leisure times we have enough money to follow our interests in music and it's possible for musicians and music companies or bands to specialize in a very well stratified spectrum of genres. And there are niches on the market which can be used for that. So today's musical scene is really fragmented and that's a reflection of the general state of, of, of the society. Society is fragmented in many respects, not only musical tastes, but if we look at ideologies, political orientations, or, well, any, any cultural field, we would probably find similar situation with many specialized, you know, uh, activities addressing specific audiences. 
that's like politics, which is fragmented today in many countries. Okay. Uh, just before the start of the pandemic, and now I would like to go from the music itself as genre, to, from the listener towards the industry. So just before the pandemic, at the beginning of 2020, you stated that the music, in, the music industry is recovering from the crisis. How do you see the situation now? Would you repeat the same sentence? Well, no, that, that sentence concerned the recovery from a long crisis caused by the new media. Music industry was heavily hit in late 1990s by technological developments like you know, CDs and possibilities of pirate copies. And then came the distribution of music via internet. And for music industry, it took practically two decades to develop business models. And it was necessary to wait for even technological advancement on the side of listeners. So after 2010, more and more listeners were ready to buy music via internet and uh, services like Apple Music or Google Play uh, have been successful in, in developing suspect, su successful business strategies. And this development was probably not hit by the pandemic because exactly in this situation, the new models distributing music via internet are very effective even today some 20 years ago, the CD shops or shops selling records would be closed in the pandemic. But the distribution of music via internet is relatively safe, even in this difficult time. So I think I have no, no reliable data from the last year, but I think there is no reason for the music industry to be as well, damage in, 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 in any way by the new situation. Maybe even the opposite is true. Maybe services like Netflix in, in, in the video industry or these services selling music uh, via internet are successful and they are in a way winners of the new market situation. Great to hear that there are some winners when it comes to the pandemics. Uh, well, they are obviously in some industries. Yeah. Uh, I would go back to your research and uh, I just again come across an article which uh, I was very thrilled to actually find out what you meant by the title. Because you stated that the burglar is leaving and the global villager is coming. And who in your understanding who, who in that context is actually a global villager when it comes to the musicology and perception of music? Well, you know, that's a borrowed phrase, global village, from Marshall McLuhan uh, from the 1960s. But, well, the notion reflects basically, uh, uh, it reflects the availability of, of every kind of music for everybody uh, in the world which is quite a new uh, situation compared to the past in which some, well, it's not so long time ago, you know, 50 years ago, music was just distributed via records and the records were relatively expensive and the availability of music, well, was really limited to compared to the uh, present. So the, the global village is the environment in which that omnivorous listener, to get back to the phrase, well, is the winner of the situation. That's the, the, the type of the listener who is rather happy in, in this new environment in which any music from any part of the world is available instantly for, for, for anybody who, who pays some 10 euro or 8 euro for 
monthly for, for access to the databases with music. In that context, uh, uh, how do you perceive the role of festivals, concerts, uh, radio plays in, in disseminating music? You mentioned that the records were expensive. Now we are maybe a little bit overrun by the availability uh, online music. So where, where these, tra let's say, traditional forms actually stand in that context? Well, it's quite interesting that the live performances of music uh, have received some revival over the last 15 years. Uh, and many bands will earn more money from live performances than from records distributed by internet. So the, the live performances of music are really important in the last decade. Naturally, this pandemic is, well, a heavy damage for, for the scene, but we can hope that it will again prosper and live music will be again really important for many people. That's a big change because uh, in 1980s or 1990s, uh, most revenues for musicians came from CDs, from selling records. But over the last 15 years, it's the live performances which generate the income mostly, with some exceptions. With some exceptions. And in that context, who is actually the owner? Who owns the music? <laughs> well, well, that's, well, it, there are many answers to, to that question. Uh, naturally, there is a, well, answer offered by copyright. Uh, in that respect, it's relatively clear who owns and for how long uh, music uh, written or recorded. But there is another aspect to the question. Every listener has some sort of his own music, which is uh, important to him or her. And most of us uh, develop this sort of ownership between, well, the age of, of being 14 or 18, you know, in this, this period of, of, of our lives. And we mostly keep this music with us practically until the death. And the basic pattern of our taste is created before being 18, and then we add something to that pattern, but we don't change the, the elementary pattern of our taste. We keep it, and if we conduct research on, on music preferences in, in some, on some timelines, we can follow how the age cohorts keep their musical taste, their music, and then they disappear. Uh, it's quite interesting in the Czech Republic, for instance, to follow the history of American country music, which came to the Czech Republic in 1960s as a very fashionable phenomenon because country music was, you know, partly it was connected with the image of America and free world. And simultaneously, it was a sort of music relatively independent from the recording industry. It was a sort of folk music. Uh, in the communist era, the import of records from the West was very limited. And this music could be played by local bands, local people, and many well, young people learned the songs. And there was a sort of, of nationalization, Czech nationalization of, of country music with Czech lyrics. And if we look at the data from various surveys, we can follow how the people who were 15 in 1966, 67, how they developed their taste and they kept it. 
and they get older and older. But still, in the Czech Republic, the popularity of country music is so strong that there are private broadcasters who will deliver radio programs fully covered by country music. So that's a good example of the ownership of, of music on the side of listeners who are quite loyal to their music. How do you see the future when it comes to the country music? Because you mentioned it's the 1960s, 1970s. So where, what is the future now for the songwriters, for the country music bands? Are they going to continue uh, flourish as they used to, or are we going to see a change and something new is coming up? They will probably continue. It was the case with many music genres, but country music will definitely lose its status as a very popular music genre. You know, in 2000, 50% of the Czech population uh, had some sort of, of liking or preferences for country music. It won't be the case today and in the future. But probably country music can follow the model of maybe jazz music, which used to be the popular music of 1930s, 40s and 50s, and then was succeeded by rock music. And gradually jazz music became some sort of minority taste or minority activity. These days, some 10% of population or less uh, have liking for jazz music, and it becomes very close to classical music in many respects. So maybe we can expect uh, similar developments with country music uh, that's similar probably to the case of Czech folk music or Moravian folk music, which is rather specific. And while it used to be very popular in 1950s, today it's still popular, but in a minority environment, which is rather intellectual, uh, it's preferred by many well-educated well people, not only by, by well, the folks in the country, so maybe we can expect similar, expect similar developments in the case of country music. In But that regard, I guess. I guess. In that regard, how difficult is actually to conduct a research when it comes to the musicology? Well, uh, I, I think it, it's similar to, to many other well disciplines because uh, you either have to conduct some research in archives like historians, you have to read old manuscripts in different languages and uh, written by, well, rather difficult writing, style of writing, or you can decipher old notation for pieces of music written in the Renaissance or Middle Ages periods. That's one way how to, do, to, to conduct musicology. And then there is the other option I mostly follow, and that's on the board of sociology. So, so you have to talk to people, you have to conduct survey, with, you have to work with questionnaires, with statistics. So that's similar to other disciplines, but it's, it, it's not more or less difficult. I think it normally depends from the topic you select. <laughs> How hard it is. Okay, we we do have a, uh, a question on YouTube, and the question goes that what is your view of musical education in school systems all around the world, and is it covered enough to uh, help and give guidance to young people to embrace their music, or shall there be a different approach or way to go? Well, that's a good question even if difficult for generalizations. I think there are many approaches how to teach music and how to deliver music education in primary or secondary schools. But in general, I think still there is a lack of, of, uh, of um, appropriate approach. Um, one of the 
former professors of musicology in Brno, in my university, wrote in 1930s an article quite interesting about how to, well, offer music education in schools which are not oriented to music, general education. And he was very unsatisfied with the way in which the kids are forced to sing songs or uh, just, uh, you know, to memorize some names of composers and, and compositions. And he asked to develop some method to help people to understand music, to, to improve their experience in listening to music. And I think that's an important task for today's musicology and music education still. Uh, we should definitely do more for the broad audience to help people who are not trained musicians to develop better understanding of music, especially in the case of classical music, because uh, naturally you anybody can listen to Mozart or, or Bach or Beethoven, but if you get a bit more of technical understanding what's happening in music, your pleasures are definitely heightened or improved and you discover more and more layers in, 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 in art music which offer you many, many interest, interesting you know, experiences. So I think uh, the primary task of music education should be to help people to understand music, not only to sing popular songs or folk songs or national songs, which is still the way in which many, many teachers uh, teach music education in primary or secondary schools. I would like to connect the folk songs that you mentioned to one of the branches of the musicology, which while I was studying for today's Science Cafe was popping up from almost every second YouTube video. And that's the ethnomusicology, ethno uh, one of the branches. Uh, there, it seems to be that there is a broad debate whether actually that's not a colonial term and whether it should not be the cultural musicology to rename that. And is there actually such a debate within the professional community in the Czech Republic about the decolonization, about the changing the musical curriculum? Well, it's not so much an issue in the Czech Republic. The reason is quite clear. Uh, the Czech musicology has not been strong in the area of ethnomusicology until 1989. The, the fact was that the, the researchers, the scholars, could not travel freely. And that was a big difference to our German or Austrian colleagues who traveled to Africa to conduct research on, on music there at the spot and so on. So the Czech ethnomusicology mostly concentrated on problems or questions concerning the folk music in Czech lands or Central Europe. And another fact is Czech Republic has practically no colonial past. That's a big difference to, to German or British ethnomusicology and musicology. But still, I think partly, you know, that's an ideological debate concerning the name of the discipline and uh, concerning the approaches, which are varied since the beginning of ethnomusicology. Ethnomusicology was founded practically in Germany at the end of the 19th century under a rather neutral name, comparative musicology, Vergleichende Musikwissenschaft. And that was an effort to compare tonal systems and rhythms of music in various parts of the world. Uh, but the disadvantage of this approach was mostly 
based in the fact that the researchers mostly sit somewhere, well, or sat in Berlin, in Humboldt Universität, and collected uh, recordings from the world, but they didn't conduct the research in the field. It came later, uh, then especially in the American ethnomusicology, that the scholars conducted extensive uh, field research, and naturally there are methodological questions and problems you have to solve somehow. How to, being an European musician, how to understand foreign music, you know, which is based on different concepts. For instance, in Africa, in most languages, there is no word with the same meaning, meaning as the European notion of music. In Africa, in many languages, similar words cover both, both music and dance, for instance. So, uh, so there are many conceptual problems which arise if you, if you conduct field research in ethnomusicology. And today, some researchers think that in the past, many researchers from the West were somehow biased, biased by their conceptions of European music. And today, music, ethnomusicology tries to develop more subtle approaches to foreign music. How do you how do you think it how long it will take before the ethnomusicologists and scientists scholars decide what is the hopefully correct or suitable uh, approach? Well, I think it, it it will never happen really because it, it's like in all questions of understanding between different cultures. So there is all the time a need for some sort of translation. And a translation is partly necessarily a sort of misunderstanding. Some part of meaning get lost during the translation process. But it doesn't mean we should stop translating between our cultures. We can improve the understanding and the gaps can be somehow filled, but still there will be a gap. There is no objective, you know, way how to deal with, with different cultures. That's a big difference to science. In humanities, we try to understand different historical periods or different cultures with concepts which are rooted in our own experience and we cannot avoid it. So we have to, in, in a sort of process of reiterations to improve our understanding, which is, well, an eternal process going on. You mentioned education and also the uh, view of, of approach to understand. So when we look on the Czech universities and we look to how the musicology is taught, uh, is uh, explained here, and we compare it to the Europeans, is the curriculum uh, competitive? Or in general, I are the Czech so. universities competitive to the Europeans? Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, surprisingly, if you look even into the communist era, musicology was relatively free field and if I remember the times of my study in Brno and Prague, well, the, the curriculum was the same as in Germany, in Vienna, or in Berlin, or West Berlin, or in Munich. And my teachers, my professors, were in an intensive contact with the best German musicologists who came regularly to Brno, because musicology, still music, was not so much ideological like, for instance, fields of philosophy or, well, economics or, and, and such disciplines. So the curriculum basically since, well, the time before the war, the curriculum of musicology in most European universities is rather similar, I would say. It, well, covers the spectrum of disciplines and we have very similar demands concerning the level of 
or knowledge students should have. So I think it's it's not a big difference. Naturally, the orientation of each institute depends on personalities who are active there, but the curriculum is practically identical across Europe. Well, I would like to now a little bit shift the debate. Um, as you were a uh, vice rector for I, of the Masaryk University for seven years, you were a rector for eight years, and while leaving the office in 2019, uh, you stated that uh, you wish to see Masaryk University to become a world to become a world university. So, is your wish coming true? I hope so. Uh, you know, it, it's a long process because the, the universities um, uh, in Central Europe have to cope with several problems or struggles. Uh, generally, the starting position in 1989 was rather weak because of the long isolation from the scholarly or scientific business across the world but I think we've done quite a lot to improve the situation in the Czech Republic and some Czech universities including Masaryk universities belong into I think roughly speaking first 500 universities in the world in the rankings 20,000 universities from the world uh, are listed in these rankings. So being among the 500 is not so bad, but we have to improve, which is quite hard a job. We still have to attract more international staff, for instance. We have to learn to publish in better journals, we have to overcome the language barrier, which is uh, obviously one of the limits for the universities from small nations. Uh, and we definitely have to improve the stand standards of teaching. Uh, still, the Czech universities cope with difficult history uh, they used to be very elite universities looking at numbers of students until 1990s and then came a delayed massification which came after 2000 and over a couple of years the universities accepted uh, many more students much more than was probably reasonable and possible to properly educate. And then gradually we have recovered from this crisis of massification, but still we have to develop more individual approaches to students. We have to shift from, you know, front lecturing students to more interactive forms of, of, of teaching and the standards of the teaching profession in universities have to improve. That's my impression. I had the opportunity to teach in Britain for a while in the past and compared to the British standards of, of uh, academic culture, we have still to, to, to work on it a bit. In my experience, if I, you know, sometimes as rector visited some lectures in the university, it seems to me we have to work on, on our academic culture a bit. But it's a, it's a gradual process. And the more our students go abroad and go and return back and doctoral students and young assistants go to get some experience in, in, in good universities, it helps us to improve. Okay, we have another question coming through YouTube and it's mentioned the education in classical music and that it leads to better experience while listening to it. However, 
the classical music is often not accessible to general public. So what is your view when it comes to the accessibility or democratization of the classical music? Well, I think it's really important issue, but there are big differences uh, if we look at, at the data concerning European countries. So uh, I don't know from which country the question comes, but the situation in Czech Republic is actually not bad because there is a long tradition of music schools delivering a relatively cheap music education in instrument playing and singing and so on. There, uh, they used to be run by, by, by cities, towns in the past, and during the communist era they were nationalized, and even after the change of the regime, the government supports from the public sources a dense network of music schools covering the whole country. And I think it's still affordable uh, to, to let the kids to, to, to study there for, for relatively broad uh, layers of, 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 of the society or strata of the society. Uh, I'm pretty well aware of the fact that there, is, there are still some limits to that, but it, in my own experience living in, for instance, a South Moravian village, so you can well normally see many young kids from various social backgrounds to attend music schools. So not, it's not so much an elitist uh, entertainment or activity as the people could believe. And I think a relatively good situation is in some other countries, like Austria, in my experience, or uh, in Scandinavia, if we look at the data from uh, Eurostat concerning uh, music activities, cultural activities in Europe, uh, you can quite easily see that uh, in the north, especially in Scandinavia, most people will conduct some musical activities, play instruments and so on. It's relatively good in Central Europe. It's a bit worse in the South. Even there are big differences among countries and regions. But uh, I think it's primarily today not a question of, of money in many countries. It's maybe a question of motivation. And what's really important is that it's important that the kids meet motivated and motivating music teachers. For a young person being six years old, it's really important how kind and, and enthusiastic the music teacher is. It shouldn't be a torture for the kids, even if music education is not simple because my own experience being a cellist is rather difficult, you know. You have to train regularly some six, seven, eight years, which is not a big fun. And then comes the fantastic, you know, experience of playing string quartet with other young colleagues and having this sort of experience which is not comparable to anything in my life. So um, you have to, to wait quite a long time before the music gives you a real pleasure. And it's easily to be lost, you know, to be frank with you. I stopped, you know, training regularly, playing cello, being vice rector and director. And today I don't play anymore because it wouldn't be any fun. I hope being retired, I will find time again, you know, to train regularly at least two, three hours a day to get back my pleasures from music. Was it helpful for you as a, when it comes to the science to be a musicologist and at the same time being a practitioner or actually conducting the music? 
did it help you or or was it just well, I, I haven't been a conductor but naturally musicology is a discipline in which you have to combine scholarship and musical practice it's rather different for instance from the art history students of art history are not usually expected to paint or well, make sculptures but in musicology there are compulsory you know courses uh, piano lessons and intonation and such practical disciplines and that's really important because you don't need to be first class performer necessarily it's not the case but you have to have some extensive understanding of technical problems and you have to be able to have some uh, mental ability to read music uh, i'm not a conductor i cannot read a symphonic score orchestral score but at least you should be able to read in the score you know a melody and accompaniment or two voices and have some ability to hear it in, in your mind that's quite important for musicology i have another question which is related to the education and again came through the chat uh, whether the musicology itself is on the rise uh, when it comes to the standard education or whether it's actually pushed away by the more technical disciplines, by more more, more uh, uh, science and technology? Well, it's definitely in a state of decline. In many countries, professor, professors' positions, for instance, in Germany, are not, well, uh, be the besetzt, uh, well, uh, uh, how to translate from German, or maybe, well, are uh, not, well, fulfilled after retirements, they are cancelled, you know. But I don't think the danger comes from uh, technical disciplines or sciences. The danger comes from the changes I was speaking about at the beginning of this conversation. You know, the classical music stopped to be, to fulfill the role of the art religion. And musicology as a discipline was born to educate priests for this cult of music. That's the origin of my discipline. And if the listeners stop to be such devoted listeners who need to not only to listen to play music but even to read books on music articles on music then the musicology has obviously a, a problem which have to be has to be addressed and uh, that there is a big question if there is some sort of middle ground between this art religion and entertainment some sort of middle ground not to be too rude to my catholic friends but you know i'm a protestant so so maybe there is a way how to develop a middle ground a devotion to music which is more rational not so much ecstatic like the past musicology we would need to support listeners who like to know more about the music they listen to. And that's the audience for musicology. And we have to find new ways to communicate with our audience, prospective audiences, and maybe we have to do more propaganda in a positive way for music. I have a very interesting experience from my travels to, to, to the States. You know, in Europe, musicologists feel, musicologists feel this, this lack of, of interest and there is an 
pessimism uh, which is based in the decline of the academic of prestige of the discipline. It's not so bad in America, surprisingly. Uh, the colleagues in, in American universities have much more confidence that, you know, music is something important for normal lives of people and music makes people better. They really believe it. You know, the German musicologist or Czech or Polish musicologist would complain about the lack of interest of the audience. But the Americans mostly speak about, you know, the mission of music in the society and they are much more optimistic. Uh, so maybe we have to uh, accommodate that, that change in, in, in music audiences. And as many uh, uh, disciplines, like sociology maybe, which used to be a prestigious discipline some 30 years ago and today faces some sort of crisis, we have to find new ways how to address broader audience. So, but the question is, you know, important to us. We have to accommodate the change. Uh, well, I have in that regard another question. You spoke about layers and discovering the layers of the music. Can you actually love the music uh, without playing the instrument? Can you actually yes, discover yeah, those yeah, layers? Yes, you can, you can, but if you have some practical musical experience, you add, you know, some more layers of, 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 of experience to the piece you listen to. Uh, you know, music, at least art music or classical music, is a very complex phenomenon because it's partly a very abstract rational structure and simu simultaneously it's full of emotions and there are these both sides or poles to to any piece of art music and uh, they both these extremes rational and emotional can interact if you if you understand both sides so i would recommend anybody to at least to start playing music as an amateur it's not necessary to be a perfect you know performer and professional musician at all but well in any age you can start to play piano or other instruments and you can have fun. Uh, you spoke about fun, about the perception and also about the motivation. So now I would like to ask you, what is your motivation when it comes to the musicology and science and how you keep up the motivation to actually continue although through your busy schedule to, to carry on? Well, uh, uh, to be frank with you, my primary motivation is that I like to teach. To teach, to, to, to be in contact with students. And to do that, well, it's in, in, in a university necessary to do research, to be able to talk about something interesting for students. But my primary business is teaching at the university. That's what I really love to do. And well, that's my motivation because, you know, in any class, there are at least a few students who are these bright, you know, students who ask the right questions and who are able to provoke you to think the topic over and over and to find new approaches and new aspects to something you thought you know very well but the teaching is the real pleasure for me so 
Do you remember your first year in college? Yeah, I as do. As being as a student. It, it, it was really nice. It was 1982 in September. And in Bano, the musicology department organized annually a big conference attended by the best European musicologists. So I had the opportunity to listen to uh, lectures delivered by really top musicologists, musicologists of that time, and to accompany some of them from the railway station to uh, the university that was the task for the freshman students and to conversate with some of them during the breaks and coffee breaks. It was a good introduction into the world of, 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 of scholarship. That was a really important experience for me. And at that moment, I have decided that I will I wish and I will die at my department, maybe, you know. <laughs> I, I, I will uh, abandon the academic career, uh, even if I'm now in, in politics in a way, active in some other fields simultaneously, but I still teach a few courses in, in, in the university and I cannot imagine being somewhere else. So then how it actually happens that a devoted scientist, a teacher, becomes a politician? Well, it, it, it's a gradual process and I would say it's almost standard for rectors, at least in my university, because already two of my predecessors went this way. But, you know, being a rector of a big public university in the Czech Republic means you interfere with politics practically every day. You have to negotiate with ministers and uh, members of parliaments. You try to influence the educational policies of, of the state. And even you have some responsibility for the public opinion in the country. Uh, being rector of a big university gives you an opportunity and responsibility to influence the, the, the situation in the country uh, in a way which is favorable for, for free universities and academic life. Uh, I have the experience from the totalitarian regime. I was 25 when the communist regime broke down. And I'm really loyal to the new regime, which was born in 90s, even if it has different weaknesses. But still, I fully realize that free university life is possible only in a free democratic country. However pathetic it may sound, it, it, it's a condition which, which is absolutely necessary. So I've, as, a, as a rector, I started, you know, to, to make public statements and became a player in, 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 in the public scene. So it was rather natural for me to make a step further and to run for the election to the Senate, which is the upper, less influential chamber of the Czech parliament, which is mostly well, some well, function of, of, of uh, checks and balances in the system. It's uh, not so demanding as, uh, as uh, the, the House of Commons. Uh, what's what the uh, professional life concerns? It's relatively possible to combine some professional activities with the, the position in the Senate. It's the upper chamber 
in the tradition, you know, of the Austrian Empire oh. in a way. It's a joke mostly, but uh, still, uh, Antonin Dvořák, the famous composer, was the member of the upper chamber of the Austrian Parliament. Uh, so that's maybe quite quite possible way how to be active in 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 the broad public. Uh, uh, it seems that there are no other questions coming up in the chat and in, in the streams. So I would like to very much thank you for today's discussion and debate. A pleasure. Um, I also would like to uh, uh, thank to our uh, participants, to uh, those who posted their questions, to those who help us have uh, the technical setting possible and I also would like to wish you to keep up your motivation and to carry on your love for music. Thank you very much for the kind conversation. Thanks and thank you to the listeners. Goodbye. Goodbye.